as a kind of an introduction to my introduction today, I feel like I should actually point out, in case anyone has already noticed, that the whole series this summer in Spirit and Truth is kind of a revisiting of a much shorter series of messages that I preached here almost five years ago now. now I'd done that in the fall and the series got truncated a bit because we came into the season of Advent and actually had to change themes before we could cover all the ground. Not that I have been preaching the same sermons this time around as I did last time, I haven't. The subject matter has been a little bit similar, but the sermons have been new. But having said that, today is going to be a little bit different because as I was working back through the relationship between covenant and worship this week, I came to the conclusion that this is something that we really need to do to cover again very specifically um, this aspect of things. And I freely admit to having plagiarized myself. If you have the kind of memory that goes back five years, then some of this sermon might sound pretty familiar, but I genuinely believe that we really need to consider this before moving on this summer and looking at specific aspects of how we worship the Lord. I believe it because for quite a long time now, I have been hearing people talk about having a personal relationship to Jesus Christ. And I think I understand where that language comes from because back when people first started to talk that way, there were a lot of people around who seemed to think that being a Christian was really more or less synonymous with just being a churchgoer. I even have some vague recollection as a young teen of asking one of my friends if he was a Christian, or I think I may have even asked him if he was saved, and the reply that he gave back was, well, I go to such and such a church now, and, and I actually used to go to that one. I was baptized over there, which was not really an answer. I didn't ask him if he attended church or where he was baptized. I asked him if he was saved, but back then, a lot of people seem to think that to say, yes, I go to church at this group or with this group or another was really the same thing as being a Christian. And I think that's when we began to hear people say things like being a Christian is about more than just attending church. It's about having a personal relationship with God. And I do remember it was the late Keith Green who once said, Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. And I think both of those things are probably true as far as they go, but I don't think it's really an apples to apples kind of analogy. It's also true that the idea of personal relationship, whether we are talking about a personal relationship to Jesus in terms of salvation or a personal relationship to God in terms of worship, that language is really pretty vague. The words personal relationship may mean different things to different people and they may give us some false impressions of what it means to be a Christian and what it means to worship God. I told this story before. This is one of those places where I'm plagiarizing myself, so it might sound familiar, but I think it just makes the point pretty well, and I couldn't think of another story that did. So once, not too long ago, and I want to emphasize this is not a personal story. It's not about me. Um, but once, not too long ago, there was this awkward young man who sometimes had troubles relating to the young ladies and to that extent it could be a personal story but you're going to see in just a minute why it is not anyway this particular young man um, as much as he wanted to do so he was he was never confident enough in himself to even ask a girl out on a date so when he finally did get around to asking a young woman to go for a cup of coffee with him one day he was really thrilled and i mean thrilled when she agreed and i understand they had a lovely time conversing over a cup of coffee and a bite of lunch getting to know one another a bit and then going their separate ways to their separate homes but as i said the young man was really really excited 
So excited, as a matter of fact, and this probably comes as no surprise at all these days, that one of the first things he did when he arrived home was to turn on his computer, to log into Facebook, and to post about the date that he just had with this young woman, which would have been bad enough, but speaking of truly awkward, he chose at that moment to change his status from single to in a relationship. Now, because he was friends on Facebook with the young woman, she saw this change to in a relationship, and she let him know before the sun had gone down on their date that his status was still very definitely single. It was kind of a painful lesson for this guy, but all things considered, it kind of highlights the flexible manner in which we use words like friend and relationship. The way we use words in general, really, in this age of online friends and Facebook relationships. To me, that makes it all the more troubling when we use the language of personal relationship to speak of our faith in Christ and of our connection to the church, which is the body of Christ. It is, of course, true that being a Christian is about much more than mere church attendance, but as true as that fact is, I'm not entirely sure that many people knew, even when we first started using that language, exactly what we meant by the second clause, the part about having a personal relationship with God. There are people in this world who just cannot comprehend what some churches mean when they sing a song like, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. They don't get it. They don't believe in the supernatural. They don't understand what it would mean to have a personal relationship with a God that you cannot see and cannot touch. And especially now, that the language of relationship has been forever altered by Facebook and other social media. How could it really have much meaning for people today for us to say, well, you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus? Frankly, I don't think a lot of people know what the word relationship means anymore. To one person, being in a relationship means we had coffee, we spent an hour getting to know one another. To others, it might mean we're sharing a house and a bed. We just don't really believe in that so-called social convention of married. What exactly then would it mean to have a personal relationship with God? And furthermore, these days, when we say something is personal, what we very often mean to say is, frankly, it's really none of your business. So some troublesome evangelist comes along and he wants to know if I've heard the gospel and if I truly believe that my hope of eternal and abundant life is found in Christ alone and by extension whether or not I am or might like to be a member of some church or other, all I have to do is say, that's personal. My relationship with God is, is a personal relationship. It becomes like politics or personal finance. Who are we to pry into the nature of someone else's personal relationship with God, never mind anyone else. The thing is, apostles and prophets, the scriptures themselves have always done exactly that. God has never left it up to us to define the nature of our relationship to him. God has never said, just believe in me, whatever that means, to you, and everything will come right in the end. Just, just like me on Facebook. I always cringe when somebody posts on Facebook and says, if you like Jesus, you know, click like on this. I can't imagine God saying, just like me on Facebook, and that'll be adequate. Now, I agree with the author who wrote, I'm not denying that God's interaction with us is a relationship or that it is personal. But when you combine those two words today, the resulting phrase has connotations that don't really help us understand how God and man relate to one another. The same author went on to say, the biblical word covenant is much better. 
Now, of course, we know that the Bible includes many stories that are wrapped around this idea of covenant and that people in the Bible very often find themselves relating to God on the basis of one covenant or another, particularly when they have violated the terms of said covenant. But in truth, the Bible is not simply a storybook that tells stories about people who are living in covenant with God. The Bible is the book of the covenant, containing as it does the the sacred scriptures of both the Old and New Testaments. So what is a covenant? I've asked that question to a surprising number of people, and a surprising number of people really struggle to answer it. Well, it's critically important to us, though, in understanding what it means to have a relationship with God. More than that, it's critically important to us in terms of understanding the Bible at all. Because if we don't understand the nature of a covenant, what it is and what it accomplishes, then we won't understand the scriptures, which are simply covenants that God made with the people that he created, much less the nature of the relationship that we are meant to have with God within that covenant context and structure. So what is a covenant? The Presbyterian Catechism for Very Young Children gives us a brief definition. It says that a covenant is an agreement between two or more persons, which is very true as far as it goes. On the other hand, the Bible doesn't give us a precise definition of covenant, primarily because the Bible was being written at a time when the idea of covenant was so deeply embedded into the day-to-day life of the people who were receiving the scriptures that it simply wasn't necessary. Consider for just a moment the fact that the book of Genesis, which includes several different covenants that God made with various people, is itself, the entire book, is the introduction to the covenant that God made with his people at Sinai. So standing there at the foot of the mountain, seeing the the fire up on the top and hearing the audible voice of God himself saying, I am the Lord your God. I am Yahweh your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. If there was anyone there that day who felt inclined to say, yeah, that's that's really nice, but who is the Lord? That's what Pharaoh asked when Moses went to him and said, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. Pharaoh said, "Uh uh-huh. And who exactly is this Yahweh person? Well, eventually Moses would answer that question with the book of Genesis. Moses would, in effect, say, well, here's who God is. He's the all-powerful creator. He made everything by the word of his power in the space of six days, and he has the right over his creation to hold it accountable to a certain standard of righteousness. And he has the right to judge when people fail to live up to that standard. So the people of Israel didn't need a definition of covenant because they were right in the middle of living out a covenant that God had made with them when he brought them up out of Egypt. It's, It's the same question we sometimes get or the same dynamic we occasionally get. Why doesn't the Bible start by trying to prove the existence of God in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1? Well, because Genesis was written by Moses and given to the people of Israel who had stood there at the foot of the mountain and had seen God and heard his voice speak from the cloud and from the fire. They didn't need proof. They had already seen it with their own eyes. They didn't need a definition of covenant because they were in one. God had made a covenant with them. We read something of this in Exodus 24, the text that we looked at a little while ago. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all, that the, wor- all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. I can't let this slide by without mentioning. This comes after. God appearing on the top of Sinai and speaking audibly the words of the law 
to his people who are gathered there at the foot of the mountain. If you've ever watched the Charlton Heston version of the Ten Commandments, it is absolutely wrong. If you've ever watched the cartoon, The Prince of Egypt, parents, take your Bibles and, and read the real story to your children or to your grandchildren. It's wrong. You almost have some sympathy for those people who Moses disappears and he's gone for 40 days and they're thinking, oh, what are we going to do? Moses is gone. Let's make an idol. But the fact of the matter is, God had spoken to them as a nation and audibly said, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. God had said all of that to them and they come to this day the day before Moses goes up the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, and they say, all oh, the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and he put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, that book that he just inscribed himself. When he wrote down all the words of the law, he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. And once again, for the third time actually, they say all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and he threw it on the people and he said, behold, the blood of the covenant the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now we have an amazing description in this story from Exodus 24 of a liturgy, of a service of worship. Because of the sacrifice of animals and the shedding of blood, it's quite different than what we do today, but the pattern for what we do is already there. We're going to see more about that in the weeks to come. And some parts of it just echo down across the centuries, particularly those words, behold the blood of the covenant. They should ring a bell for us even to this day because not only did Jesus use the very same language in his institution of the Lord's Supper in the text from Mark 14, we hear them several times a year as a part of our worship right here in this church. There's a pattern that God established that carries through from the Old Testament, the days of Moses, right on through to the time of Jesus and into the early church. But we have to move quickly now. Biblical covenants and ancient covenants in general have essentially five parts, and those five parts together define the terms of the relationship that comes to exist between the parties who are covenanting together. In the first place, God introduces himself into the situation. He takes hold of the people who are involved. In Israel's case, he called them and he brought them up out of Egypt. The first words of the Ten Commandments illustrate the principle God takes hold. Remember how he began that statement of the covenant? I am the Lord your God. There's a, there's a statement about the transcendence of God but also a statement about why they are here. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So God takes hold and he introduces himself as the transcendent, all-powerful Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus did much the same with his disciples in a little bit different sense when he took hold of an ordinary loaf of bread and of an ordinary pitcher of wine, things that were part of nearly every meal in the ancient Near East. He took hold of them. He made them his own. And having taken hold, God then sanctifies. He sets apart. He makes holy. He separates the people or the elements involved from their usual understanding and usage. In Exodus 24, you may recall, after the slaughter of the bulls for the peace offering, 
Moses took half of the blood and he splashed it against the altar. We've been talking about worship as sacrifice. That's exactly what Moses is doing. They bled those bulls, they burned them and offered them as an ascension offering, a burnt offering before the Lord. And then he took half of the blood and he threw it against the very same altars. But then having read the book of the covenant to the people and having heard their response, we will do everything that the Lord commands us, we will obey. He made the people pass before them, before him, and he baptized them. He sprinkled them with the other half of that blood, declaring as he did, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. He set them apart in that covenant action as belonging completely, body and soul, in life and in death, we might say, to the Lord their God. Jesus sanctified the bread and the wine when having taken hold to break it and to pour it out, he said, this looks like bread, but it's my body. And this looks like wine, but this is the blood of the new covenant, which is in my blood, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. God takes hold and God sets apart. And then even though the steps are not always precisely chronological, God speaks. His word, in fact, is part of that sanctifying process. But by his word and spirit, he then calls us, having set us apart to the obedience of faith, promising blessing for those who live in covenant with him. In Israel, this was summed up in the Ten Commandments in the book of the law. In Christ, it's summed up for us in that great commission that we're all so familiar with where Jesus said, go into the world, or as you go into the world, make disciples from all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, setting them apart. And then what? Teaching them to do everything that I have commanded you. I've often said this, but I'm, I'm going to say it again. Sometimes we read that in modern times as if it says, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to believe everything that I have commanded you to believe or everything I've taught you to believe. Jesus doesn't just talk about faith in the Great Commission. He talks about discipleship. He talks about following. He breaks the bread of the, the fellowship and he pours out the cup of blessing and he reminds us that as we partake, as we eat, we proclaim him as one voice and one body united in him. God takes hold, God sets apart, God speaks. And in each case, old and new, God then seals his covenant words to his people through what we know as sacraments. After the sprinkling of the blood and the declaration, behold, the blood of the covenant, Moses and the elders of Israel went partway up the mountain. A lot of times we kind of breeze past this story because it comes between the Ten Commandments and the golden calf. But it's another indictment, if you will, on the elders and leaders of Israel because they went up the mountain part way. And Moses and the elders of Israel ate and drank in the presence of God. And God did not lay hands on them to judge them. He, he welcomed them. His transcendent presence appeared above them and they ate and drank. It's, it's very sacramental language and we do the same every time that we come into this place to gather at the table of the Lord. We ascend spiritually to Mount Zion, the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and we eat and drink in the presence of God himself, receiving the grace that he has promised to those who partake in faith, a fellowship, a communion in the body and blood of the Lord. As God makes covenants with his people, he seals us to himself. Baptism, 
the Lord's Supper, these things symbolize the washing that we receive through the blood of Christ and the presence and sealing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And finally, biblical covenants inevitably include provision for their succession or perpetuation. The Israelites were told, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Long before there was Netflix or other streaming services for people to binge on, God said, binge on my words. Teach them diligently. Indoctrinate your children. Make sure that they know and, and talk of them when you're sitting down, when you're walking, by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. We have a similar dynamic in the New Testament where we are told not to be faithless hearers of the word, but faithful doers of the word. And even in the supper, we are told as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim. It's a memorial, but in a sense that the word that, that we have for remembrance carved on the front of the table here is a word that, that speaks of the memorial offering. The memorial offering that rose before the throne of God is an offering of sweet-smelling savor. And Jesus is saying, as often as you do this, as often as you enter into this memorial, you proclaim. You proclaim to who? And you proclaim why? Well, that's why we don't do the Lord's Supper as individuals and just worship God because we have a personal relationship with him. We do the Lord's Supper as the body of Christ, and we proclaim to the world that Jesus is Lord. Now, honestly, we find in Scripture that these five parts are a little bit fluid. But even though the parts sometimes blur and blend, they are unequivocally not ambiguous. They do not leave us wondering, what does it mean to have a personal relationship with God? What are the terms of such relationship? They don't leave us wondering that because God himself defines the covenant. God himself says, this is what it means to know me and to be one of my children. And then he invites us by his grace to come on his terms and to enter in and to live every day in relationship with him. It doesn't mean that we have our own personal Jesus, as a song characterized it a number of years ago. It does mean that Jesus Christ, the second person of the triune God, wants us to know him as he truly is, and to follow him, walking in obedience to the covenant that he inaugurated by offering his own body and blood for us on the cross. And this trusting Jesus enough to keep covenant and to follow in the way that he has commanded is the very definition of what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. There are a lot of people, it appears today, who just want to go online and say, I love Jesus. But when confronted with the word of God, when confronted with the reality that Jesus says, great, now go out and live for me. Oh, well, I, yeah, I don't want to do that. That sounds like legalism. I just want to be saved by grace through faith. I just want to say I love Jesus. But to love Jesus means to trust him. To trust him means to walk in faithfulness and obedience to the covenant that God has made with us in him. Honestly, the idea of having a personal relationship that is defined by covenant should not really be all that foreign to us. Anyone who is married has exactly that kind of relationship. Marriage is about as personal as you can get in the realm of human relationships. 
But marriage is ultimately defined and defended by the covenant that was made between husband and wife, calling God as witness to the reality of this new person who was created out of the two in that covenant ceremony. See, in the covenant of marriage, and, and, and I won't go into all the fine details here, but we do those same five things. We take hold. We set apart. We sanctify this relationship. We speak and make vows to one another, and we seal those vows. We seal them with the giving and, and, and receiving of rings. We seal them in other ways, too. And we plan for succession. Marriage is a covenant. It's a personal relationship that is defined by covenant. It's far more than just logging into Facebook and changing our status or even moving in together and sharing living space. It's a personal relationship defined by covenant just as our personal relationship with the Holy God is defined by the covenant that he has made with us in Christ Jesus. But there's one more area in which this understanding of covenants is of vital importance to us today and, and for the purposes of our series. It's important to us in terms of worship. Because hopefully we have seen over the last several weeks that we worship because God is worthy. We worship because it is simply our reasonable, rational, logical service, liturgy, to ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. And it's God who defines how that is to be done. Go back a few weeks. We've talked about it on a couple of occasions already. Cain brings an offering. Abel brings an offering. One offering is acceptable to God. God receives it and commends Abel for it. The other is not acceptable. It's not just a matter of coming and doing whatever we want and just assuming that if we are sincere enough, God will receive it. God defines the relationship of the worshiper to himself. He defines worship. He has set it down in his word, both in the Old and New Covenants of Scripture, the principles and the practices by which we make our approach to him. In the same way, that an awkward young man cannot begin a relationship by simply declaring on Facebook that he has done so. We cannot worship by simply declaring on Facebook or anywhere else that we sure felt like we were worshiping today. We worship in spirit and truth when we come in faithful obedience to the word of God and to the covenant that Jesus has established with his body and his blood. We will continue to reflect on this through the summer as we consider how the various pieces, the various elements of our worship service, our, our liturgy, if you will, the truo in Greek, it just it means service, literally. And we'll consider how those are connected to the various aspects of God's covenant with us, and if the Lord is willing, by the end of the summer, hopefully, we will see that worship, worship in spirit and truth, is not about getting a certain feeling and holding it for a certain period of time or anything of the kind. Worship in spirit and truth is nothing less than the ongoing renewal of the new covenant that God has established for us in Christ Jesus. As we come to understand that, then here, in the context of the church, in the context of Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way, here where we are in Christ and Christ is in us, we will come to understand what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. May we pray. Father, draw us near and speak to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Conform us to the image of Christ that, Lord, as we worship, we may worship in spirit and truth, not seeking to take something for ourselves, but rather to offer ourselves to you, knowing that we bring ourselves poor 
and lowly and miserable as we are, and we offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices, and in return you give us yourself, your holy, magnificent, awesome self. You give yourself to all those who seek you when we seek for you with all of our heart. Help us to do so. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen.